A chap came up to me and he said, my son tried to kill himself last week. What do I say to my wife? I don't know. I almost kind of feel like, how do I exit this conversation nicely? Last year, I was introduced to PTSD out of nowhere. That was horrible. Uh, all of a sudden, I was having panic attacks, which I never had. I've taken fluoxetine, but I was told to come off of because it was then told that it increases suicidal thoughts, which you asked me, well, that sounds pretty dangerous. I get a lot of tweets that are like, you're fueling, you're fueling the agenda. Guess what? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like saying, you fraud, you fake fucker, you prick. Listen, when I die and I see him again, I'm fucking hitting him. Hi, it's going to be a scrap. Boy, is it going to be a scrap. Hello and welcome to Unfiltered. My name is Ollie Dugmore. My guest today, at one point in his life, was probably best known for being the son of an 80s music icon. But that was then, and this is now. Today, he's an accomplished presenter and mental health campaigner. After seven years helming the Capital FM breakfast show, he was recently announced as the one show's new co-host. It was at Capital that he met his best friend and producer, Joe Lyons, who tragically took his own life in 2020. Since then, my guest's mental health campaigning has seen him open up about his own experience with depression, revealing that he too once found himself considering the devastating decision to end his own. His recently released documentary, The Fight for Young Lives, is his second, Exploring Mental Health, and dives deeper into how the issue is approached by schools, the NHS, and government. My guest today is Roman Kemp. Hello, thanks for having me. How's what an tricks? introduction. Was it okay? Yeah, it was very good, very formal. Yeah, well, that's me. Mr. Yeah, formal. yeah, yeah. No, that no, was nice. It was really nice. Um, not awkward? Yeah, no, not at all. I, I was surprised. I, I love that you refer to my dad as an 80s, <laughs> and that's, that's nice because keep him in his box. Yeah, keep him there. Stay there. Keep him there. That was um, your time. Now it's my time. Yeah. Although he'll still say it's still his time. You think? Yeah, it's always his time. <laughs> like, that is the one thing that, like, it, it's, uh, it's quite a comfortable knowledge to know that I'll never be able to reach his status of national treasure because he does it in a different way. Like, there's one thing being what he would deem a national treasure. Mm. And then there's another thing being that good looking as well as it. <laughs> and that's what You're not annoying. too bad yourself. Nah, mate, but that's annoying. That's like, honest. like he's 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 got it. Yeah, like, and because also he had all the, the he had all of the the girls that were like mad for Spandau Ballet back in the day, mm -hmm. and that's a different breed of person. Yeah, do you know what I mean? But like, you've had like you know the, you Nile Horan or whatever on yeah. this podcast, like you know the One Direction types of insane. Like you know it's insane. Insane. Yeah, that's the I, only reason you got him on it. One hundred. You know yeah. he's the most boring man alive. Why else steal, would you? I was trying to steal a bit yeah, of his fan club, bait. bit of his fandom. Yeah, I wanted yeah. that. I wanted that. Um, so they're not queuing up outside Global after your breakfast show. No screaming. No signs. None of that. No. Um, Maybe one day, it's, man. It's you know what? It is strange. It is strange. Like, and don't tell you, like you know, I say it in the in the new documentary. My my world is far different to to what my dad has or what he had. Like mm. you know, now I, I you know after I did I'm a celeb. Uh, like in 2019, I had like this kind of time period of about a year. Well, why not even? Because I had, uh, you know, I had COVID. Everyone had COVID, right? Mm. And so, so we couldn't go out. And then it was this time period of like, you know, people coming out to you asking for selfies a lot, and there was that thing. But then after, you know, I released the first documentary about Joe, then it just switched, and people don't come up to me for selfies. They come up to me, you know, telling me about how. They, they want to take their own life or they want to, you know, sorry to make it dark at the beginning, but like, let's go there. That's, that's what happens now. And I said it in the thing. I was like, you feel like you're just like kind of some sort of like suicide boy poster mm. thing for it. And sometimes you just want to say, I'm not, I, I find it really difficult because sometimes when people come up to me, I, I want to just say to them, look, I, I, I can't help you. Yeah. I'm not a doctor. Like, do you know what I mean? Or a psychotherapist or anything like that. And also you're terrified to say the wrong thing. So it's um yeah in in short my my experience of of fame as it were very different to my dad. We'll obviously get into all of the um substantive issues around yeah mental health um over the course of the episode and so I don't want people to get the wrong impression that I'm going to be like and so how does that make you feel because obviously you're the most important person in all of this. But no just, no no. Uh, whilst you're saying that so yeah it obviously must take a toll right to have people coming up and sharing these really deep harrowing things with you and. Also, as well, an added thing on top of that, the powerlessness you've just described to so sometimes being able to be like, I can't help you, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really hard because it's a double-edged sword. You'll have some people listening to this, and maybe it's you listening to it right now, and you might be thinking, so what, what, what do you mean? You, you, you put yourself out there. If you put yourself out there, you've got to expect people to come up to you. Mm. 
You can't, you can't, you know, you got to have, you can't have your cake and eat it. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like, but I, and I understand that, but then they also have to understand, those people have to understand that it's really hard for when something traumatic hits you that you feel like, oh, you should help the cause a little bit. But then you do with, with a topic like that, it's so easy to bite off more than you can chew. Mm. And I kind of did that a little bit. I didn't realize how much that first documentary and how much the story would affect people. You know, I was doing that selfishly for myself, but I didn't realize how much it would affect people. And then, you know, once I was in it, I thought, well, can I swear on this podcast? I was, I was like, fuck it. Like, you know, let's keep going. Mm. You know, like, and, and so, yes, it's, it's annoying. It, it, in, in, the worst, in the worst sentence possible, mm. it is. because, And it's not annoying because I don't care about you. It's annoying because, shit, I'm like, I'm, I'm not just having to deal with, you know, grief from my own stuff. I had it the other night, like, and it was all I could think about for the rest of the day. Uh, I had it and I was on it. I was in a, a, a like a, a, an event and like a dinner, like a nice dinner. And it was celebrating like a really nice cause. And then some a chap came up to me and he said, oh, uh, my son tried to kill himself last week. W what do I say to my wife? And I don't know what to do. And I froze like quite a lot because I was just thinking, well, I, I don't know. Yeah. And like, I almost kind of feel like, how do I exit this conversation nicely? Yeah. I think there's a lot of people who... And I get it. I get why he would come up to me, but but at the same time... Yeah, it's no, like, for sure. Shit. But most people don't know the answer to that question, right? Like there's no. actually a very select few. And, and actually, also importantly, even someone who was trained to deal with that situation, if they didn't know the bloke, they didn't know his wife, and they didn't know his son... Yeah. What do I say in that situation? I can never tell you what to say in that situation. Yeah. I think it's also, uh, this is going to be, I'm sure, what we will talk about, but I mean, we might as well just start talking about it now. One of the things that frustrates me most about the mental health conversation is that we're sort of told that it's beholden on ourselves to sort it out. It's like individualized. So it might be whether that's, you know, um, your, your brain chemistry is different. You've got, you don't have enough serotonin and, you know, yeah, so that's, yeah. that's up to you and, you and your brain's off. And so what are you going to do about it? Or... Why don't you individually talk to someone about it? And I, that for me misses the ginor the broader picture, the huge picture, which is what are the systemic structural things that are forcing you into a position where you feel that way? So for example, you know, you mentioned that guy's son, he's probably a young man, right? Yeah. Uh, let's say he's a teenager or he's in his twenties or whatever. Does he own his own house? Does he feel secure in his job? Mm. Does he have a healthy relationship? Does he have a viable social life? All of those things that are not solely his responsibility like obviously he can get a job and he can try yeah, and do well but yeah, yeah. but if but if the society that he lives in does not take care of him why is it on him to fix up the problems that are in his head that are probably caused on a much broader scale than that of the individual of course of course but then that's a that's a that's an intervention problem mm. and you know and that's and that's still at the stage of intervention and that's why it's like it's hard because my campaign or like, you know, the, what I'm pushing for is not even focusing on intervention because unfortunately I feel like that system that we have there has already failed. Mm. For, I don't know how old, how old are you? 30. 30. We're the same age, right? Like you and I have grown up in a system, even though we're still quite young, you and I have grown up in a system that it doesn't really care for mental health. And so we're going to have to figure this out on our own mm. a little bit. Like, like, you know, whether or not I come to you and ask you for help or you ask someone and I go through a friend or whatever, at our age, it's already too late, right? And I believe that for anyone right now over the age of 16, if I'm totally honest, well, right? Because I think if you are out of that initial school system and you haven't learned how to understand these terrible thoughts that you have, it is a little bit too late and you're going to be on your own. And that's what you have to understand. And, and what I mean by that is you're going to be on your own in terms of the battle and you can have friends and you can have people that can be there for you and you're going to have to learn coping mechanisms on your own. That's if you don't have access to a therapist or you Most want people don't. medication. Of course, mate, 90% of the country do not. Yeah. Like, uh, and, and that's why the, the, the push for me was so much in terms of prevention, right? Suicide is in three states, uh, prevention, intervention, and postvention. And if you get in early as possible, man, like it's the same, it's, it's, it's the same analogy, but it works every time. Uh, uh, if I said to you next week, you're going to go and fight Tyson Fury, you would say to me, I've never had a boxing life, a boxing lesson in my life. How can I get lessons? I'm saying I'm leaving the country as well. Yeah, I say. But, but, but precisely, <laughs> right? But but we know as adults now, like you know, it doesn't matter if it lasts five minutes or or a year. We know that at some stage of our life, we're going to come up against anxiety. We know we're going to come up against depression. We know we're going to come up, one in four men come up against one, uh, suicidal thoughts. If we know those thoughts are coming, 
we have to understand how to deal with them. Mm. And the best way to do that is to understand how to deal with them as early as possible. So that's why, you know, the mental health support teams in schools is, is what the biggest push has to be. Yeah. So you think it's in schools early, 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 we're talking sort of prim primary school, As early as possible. School, right, as early really. as possible. And, and what I mean by that is, it, and that's not a lesson, by the way. It's, mm. that, that isn't, um, oh, we should have a lesson in the curriculum. Like PSHG or whatever. Yeah, I mean, they can teach it more in PSHG, which, which is great. I heard the other day that, that my doc, the first documentary just got added to the PSHG curriculum, which is mental. Um, cool. uh, and But the, the, the what a mental health support team does is that it's just someone there to, to help alleviate the pressure um, from the pupils, to help alleviate the pressure from the parents and from the teachers. Because a lot of the time the teachers are being targeted and I was one of those people. I was like, why aren't the teachers helping them? Why aren't the teachers doing this? But then look at it the way that I just said to you about this, this lad that's come up to me, uh, you know, imagine you're a teacher and a pupil comes up to you at the age of 11, right? Which is how young it is, yeah. right? People comes up to you at the age of 11 and says, Miss or sir, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to, I want to kill myself. What does that teacher do? Yeah. Like, and, and they've got no training in that. They're so afraid that the next thing they say or any form of advice, they can't say it. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, believe it or not, most of this country, the, the kids are from hard backgrounds that, that don't have someone at home that they can talk to. And so where do they go? Mm. And 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 what you're doing is is by putting these teams in there, you're giving a, a an outlet and and someone that can listen to the pupil, and just tell them, okay, you're thinking like this, but what if we try and do this to help you know help your thought process change a little bit? You know, you've got this in life that that you can be hopeful for. It's giving them back that you know that feeling that life is worth living, and that's what these mental health support teams do. It's just someone in their school they can go and chat to. And these people change lives. That's what they do. It's the same with youth centers. Mm -hmm. You know, youth centers, there's a massive problem in this country where we're closing them down. And we're closing them down because we don't want to give them the funding. We don't think they're proper. But we're not looking at what they actually do. They're not just a place where kids can go and eat pizza and go and play football indoors. Youth workers are incredible people that listen to kids. Because again, it's like there are so many kids and whether or not that's, there's so many kids do, dealing with trauma. Mm. And, and it's that trauma that happens at that early age that ma manufactures itself into, that manifests itself into suicide attempts later on in life. And, and that's something that has to be addressed, whether or not that's, you know, sexual abuse, physical abuse for a child, mental, uh, you know, and emotional abuse, you know, grief or losing someone. It can have huge knock-on effects. So, you know, having someone in there that can listen is just so, so important. And I think crucially as well, uh, it's someone who's, not necessarily an authority figure like a parent or a Course. teacher, right? It's someone yeah. who you can speak to on a level yeah. that you're not worried about, you know, you say something and you're going to get in trouble as a result of saying it. 100%, 100%. You know, there, there's always there's always that. And and I just think that for me, it's a no-brainer. Right? For me, it's a no-brainer. And then when I saw that, you know, that when you look at the, the results that these teams you know, show in terms of um, pupils at school, their, their happiness levels and things like that, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, asks for, for help, et cetera. They, they the, the results on them are so good in terms of what, what they've done. Yet you have the people in power and they say, yeah, cool, we'll put them in 36% of schools in the country. I'm like, well, why? What's the point? And then they go, oh, well, our target now, yeah. so the target is 50%. And then you're like, why do what? what about the other half? But it's a, but it's a target. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, it's not like, if you said to me, my target is 100%. Well, I'm getting there, but I've landed on 70%. I'd say to you, great, keep going. Mm. Like, well done. Like, there's no time frame on it, but just keep going. But the fact that you can't even give a target, you can't even say, look, we're going to try. Mm. It's like, say, like, again, like, imagine we were at school, yeah? And, and the teacher goes, what do you want to get in this exam? And you go, 50. Yeah. D. I don't think they'd be that happy about it. No! <laughs> what society is that? Yeah. So, like, man, it's, it's ludicrous to me. Like, mm. it, it actually... Like, even if they say it's about budget, fine. Just say it's a hundred percent, and then look to be walking, working towards it. Have you had much interaction with the kind of um, political class, as it were, as yeah. a result of being a, a campaigner in this space? And, and if so, what's that been like? Uh, yeah, it's difficult, man. Because like, I never really thought I was a campaigner. Mm. Yeah, I know. Listen, I've just been rambling, but like, I don't. I don't classify myself as that person because I'm just like I'm a lot of the time I'm like what will be will be mm. right and and you know I get it 
I feel like I'm not, I, I feel like it's not campaigning that I'm doing. I feel like it's just pointing out the obvious mm. a little bit sometimes. When it comes to, to the people in power, I know they hear it. I know they hear it. You know, there's, there's been people that have had to go on TV and answer questions as to why they didn't answer me for so long. Or they're, you know, you know, this isn't for me. This isn't about like whose party's what. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's not, I honestly don't care. Mm -hmm. Whoever is in charge. Well, it's not party political, is it, mental health? No, not, but that's the thing that it's like, but, but what's difficult is sometimes within politics, they will try to make it like that. Mm. And, and that's where it gets lost. And that's where you hope that whoever is in power looks at it, you know, because everyone's looking for short-term gains. This is a long-term thing. Mm. That it will take time. And it's hard to get something across the people that are short-term based that this is something that will take time. But, you know, we've even done the maths for them. For every one pound spent on it, they get one pound 90 return because of the the set, the money that you save because how much is spent on post venture yep. for when people are fucked up mm -hmm. from what they've gone through. Yep. You know what I mean? And it's... It's a no-brainer for me. And as I say, like, I don't feel like I'm campaigning. I just feel like I'm talking sense. Think, and tell me if I'm wrong, please. <laughs> I will do. That. Yeah. I me. think, um, I mean, that, that, that's something, that's a problem that extends. It's not just mental health that, that that's a problem for, right? Really? It extends all sorts of issues that because of the nature of our politics, electoral cycles, it's very short-termist. It's like, am I going to get a result on this in five years? You know, will this, will this work for me when I want to stand for re-election? Not... Yeah something you know as systemic or structural as for example resolving a mental health crisis you're never oh. going to be able to fix that you know in the time it takes them to get around to it man i was devastated they, they you know they, they dropped the mental health act no change to it that was that came yeah. out yesterday absolutely yeah oh from the time we're recording this it came out yesterday yeah, yeah, in the, the king's speech yeah. in the king's speech that the no mention mm -hmm. and just move on that's like some dinosaur shit yeah, big that, time. that's in there. Yeah. Like, you know, we're always learning new stuff. You mm -hmm. can't have the same. It create it again, like it def I defies logic in my brain, and I'm yet to see someone come forward and tell me why that's the case. I think you're completely right. You know, it's it's the short it's the short termist side of things that speaks to as well. You know, for example, like the fossil fuel stuff that's in there, you know, um expanding oil and gas, again, so short termist. Um, I feel like this. Con we've kind of gone, done the conversation in the opposite way around. Yeah, rather sorry. Than talking no, no, I'm, I'm loving it. But I mean, you know, rather than talking about you, your journey, and I'd like to talk about Joe as well if you have time. We've gone straight to how do we fix this? What happened? No, I know, I know, I know. It's sorry. No, it's fine. It's I think it's because I've been talking about it so much. But, yeah. but it is. Look, I mean, look, long story short, uh, it's in the documentary. <laughs> in terms of, watch the documentary. Watch the documentary because no, because you'll see, like, you know, and I, it's a hard. And I've pointed this one to parents. Okay. It's a hard watch for parents. But I want you to watch it because I want you to see how little help there is out there for your child. And that sounds messed up to say that. It's brutal, yeah. But it's true. And then you tell me if you're happy with that. Mm. Watch the documentary and you tell me if you think that's good enough for your kid. And I, I, I'm not a parent, but I can guarantee you say it's not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about you as a kid then. Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk about your experience and... Well, may, may I just sort of open the floor up to you, to be honest with you. I don't want to sort of probe and put a question no, on No, sorry, I'll chat you... so much waffle, no, sorry. You don't, not at all, not yeah. at all. So tell, tell me about sort of your own um, sort of experiences with your mental health from maybe from like a teenage teenage perspective when you were younger. Man, I well, mine doesn't make any sense to a normal person because I grew up in the best household ever. Martin Kemp was my dad. Like, you know what I mean? Shirley Kemp was my my mum and like, you know... I, uh, I had the best family. I, well, I still have the best family. I, the, I had every Christmas present I ever wanted and like went to a private school and, you know, I wasn't shy. That, that was another thing as well is that people always say to me, oh, well, you must have been really shy as a kid. You're really inward. No, I was, I was very outward. I was, mm. you know, up, up loud and a bit ADD and like just wanted to talk all the time. Which it sounds ridiculous because I was also at the early stages of understanding what depression was and depressive like episodes were. And I used to go through them all the time. And then when I was about 15, like it was really at a point where I remember my, my dad always, my dad never really used to understand it. Like he'd get it, but he's not really from a family that spoke openly about mental health, like at all, you know, really. He was from a lower class family, you know, North London, very post war kind of family. And they never really spoke about it. So it was actually my mum who had gone through it with her dad and her older brother, um, who both 100% like suffering from depression. 
massively. Everything was negative. Everything was, um, it was just a bad way to live your life. Mm. When you wake up, the only way I could describe it was like when you wake up, there was always a dark cloud. Even if it was a lovely sunny day, it's raining over you. Why should I be happy about that? Mm. You know what I mean? I, I, I was one of those people. And it wasn't just teenage angst. It was different to that. That's an important distinction, I think, between, because sometimes, you know, we talk about depression, anxiety, and, and there's, there is also like a full spectrum of human, human emotions, right? Where yeah. there is just normal feelings of sadness and it's an important, it's not the same thing. No, it's not the same thing, but, but I think you know in your head when you, you know, I would look at my sister and go, God, cool, you're a happy person. She's like the happiest person ever. And I was like, and I always felt like I can, I can never get to that level. Mm. Why? You know, when you see other people and they're always happy mm. and you're like, how do I, I want to get there. You know, I, I, I want to be like that. And you realize that something holds you back. You know, there's almost something inside you where your friends are like, oh, you're so fun when you come out. It's because you've had a drink and you're relaxed. But like, there is something holding you back. And sometimes that can be from signs of depression or anxiety. Um, and in my case, it was both. And, and so my mum, you know, took me to the doctor and, you know, the doctor said it might be a hormonal imbalance. And sometimes that's been poo-pooed and people say oh there's no such thing as a hormonal imbalance well I, I me personally i don't care it's my body i feel like there is mm. you know like uh, when i'm when i think about it you know after that i was prescribed antidepressants and i've never not taken them since i've been on them i've had several different ones because sometimes they don't work and mm. sometimes you need to switch and you know there's uh, I get, I get a lot of stick sometimes for talking about antidepressants because, or SRAs, whatever SSRIs. they SSRIs, that's it, yeah. Thank you. They, they, they are so divisive because people are like, well, you're telling kids to take drugs. Listen, what you do with your child or what you do with your own body is your decision. Mm. I'm telling you, there is a drug that is available to me on the market that says it makes you feel better. And I don't care if it's sugar. I'm taking it. I'm taking it. And, and like, it makes me feel good. I, there's side effects. There's loads of side effects. You know, let's talk about them. That, you know, there's, I, I took I, the side effects. I've, I've had antidepressants in the past where it's killed your sex drive entirely. Mm. Like, like, and all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're with your partner at the time and you're going, you're going, I'm so sorry. Like, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't feel like, mm -hmm. you know, having sex because I, I don't know what's going on. And then you realize it's the tablets and you you change. So there are side effects and you're finding out which one's best for you. So, for me, that's my decision on them. I'm also in a very privileged position whereby I can go to a therapist. Mm. I'm not going to a therapist every week because I don't know if that's necessarily good for you. And a, and a good therapist will tell you that. A good therapist will tell you, you know, I think we're done. Mm. I think, I think, have some time away and and um, and come back when when you need it. And that's what I do. You know, I'll, I'll have episodes where, you know, last year I was introduced to PTSD out of nowhere. And that was horrible. Uh, all of a sudden, I was having panic attacks, which I never had. And, and it was like I needed a new form of therapy that I'd never had before. And, and that's, you know, what I love as well is I get a lot of tweets that are like, you're fueling, you're fueling the agenda. The, the, you're fueling the agenda. The, you're a shill. The, yeah. The, the, the mental health, you're, you're making kids, give, you're giving kids an excuse. Mm. And you're giving people an excuse. You know, the more they talk about mental health, the more they believe they have it. Guess what? Fuck off. <laughs> Firstly, <laughs> secondly, secondly, it's always been it. Yeah. My great, my great grand was put in an asylum for for postnatal depression. And they probably said she was like hysterical. Or she, she was. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Like, like it's been around for the, the, forever. We just named it something else. Yeah. So it, it's you know. It's really interesting hearing you say that about um, SSRIs. I was looking. I've been looking for ages trying to do a story on. Um, the con on the side effects, PSSSD, because I found I spoke, I speaking to some people who mm. they'd experienced the side effects you described. Yeah. But then they stopped taking SSRIs yeah. and the side effects hung around for years yeah. at times. I don't want to delve too deeply in side effects because it's personal to you, et cetera. But I'm interested. No, it's fine. Go for it. I'm interested in also like how they actually make you feel in a in a positive way. Because mm. I when I was doing the PSSSD PSSD, post SSRI, sexual dysfunction is what that stands for, yeah. story, or trying to do it anyway, I found myself immediately reaching for a, oh my God, if this is what happens, my position is, don't ever fucking take these pills. Right? Yeah. Don't, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. take them. And, and it, it's really easy from a position of relative privilege of being, I don't have depression, so 
I, yeah. It's very easy for me to say to someone, don't take SSRIs. Yes, yeah, yeah. There always has to be a place for medication, I think, in this conversation. It's not just course. therapy. It's not just fix yourself. It's not just there are systemic structural issues. Yeah. If you're going to have a serious conversation about it, there has to be some role for of medication. Course. Because sometimes, and this is what I'd like to talk about, they do make you feel better. Oh, my God. Like, what? they do. And But this is where I find it difficult because, look, I don't know the chemical side of it that much. I just know that after four days, you're feeling good. Yeah. Like, you wake up, you're... Do you know what it is, yeah? Is it, you ever have those days where you're like, oh, man, I don't want to talk to this person. Yes. I, I just like, oh, man, I can't be... But I, th I don't want to go outside my house. I can't face people right now. Mm -hmm. It changes that. And it, and it changes it into, you have a nicer outlook on life where you, you want to, you don't mind engaging it. You're interested in someone's story. You know, I mean, I talk a lot anyway, but, but you know, it, it, it is, it, it gives you that little bit of va va voom as the once great Thierry Henry said, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something that, I don't know, but that's why I say, even if someone told me today, that the pills that I'm taking were sugar, as I say, and they were a complete placebo. Yeah. Right. Thank you for fuck. Yeah. I, like, why should I yeah, care? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and what about your other emotions? Does it, um, I've spoken to some people before who've said that. Can't really cry that much. Yes, that's what they say. It's like it dampens, yeah, it dampens the depression, but it also dampens yeah. the other side of things. Yeah, I find it hard to cry. Okay. Um, I mean, not if you watch the documentary, I cry a lot in that. Um, but but that's you know that's that's heavy stuff. Yeah, of course. But I'm saying like I find it really, yeah, I find it hard, crying's hard. Um, I feel maybe more desensitized right. to stuff, and maybe that's the news and seeing that so much. But it doesn't shock me as much as it once would. Yeah, the, the sex thing was big, it was really really big. But I've changed that now. Mm. Um, we're firing on all cylinders. So pleased for you. Um, Congratulations. No, I just mean because it, like, I changed, I changed, to be honest, I changed onto a different drug. Because of that. Yeah, and quite a lot of, it turns out quite a lot of people have been doing the same into a new one. But, but, but for me, it was like, that, that was an issue. Um, but it was, well, it, was, it was only a chat with my doctor and a change. But that must have, again, I can only speak for myself, but like my conception of myself, mm. who I am as a man, I wouldn't say that like my sexuality is the foundational part of it. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly a part of it. Of course it is. We're men. We're meant to mate. And so to lose that, yeah. obviously, it, it then kind of becomes a, an additional part, right, of, of your depression. I'm not to, trying to put words in your mouth, but the, like, the idea of your sense of who you are as a man is now being affected additionally by this thing that was meant to make you better. And that must be really difficult. Fine. Let me be clear. From, from, from my side, right, and there might be men out there, and I'm sure there are, there are men that it completely annihilated it. Yeah. But don't get me wrong, like, still getting erections and you still, like, want to go and have sex. Mm. Like, it's not like, it doesn't get rid of it entirely. Yeah. It's just, it's, there'll be a lot more times that you, you have one of those days where I was like, you're I'm too tired. If you're with your partner yeah. and you're a little bit like, oh, babe, I'm too tired. Like, I, I need to go to sleep. Yeah. Like, it, that, that's, you have more of those days. Right. Um, but uh, yes, I, I understand that to an extent and it can cause issues. It can cause massive issues for, for people that are within it. But also, again, it's about, okay, if, if that side of your life is that important to you, it's choices, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, it's hard to get the balance right so that you can have all of these different things. You know, I'm lucky at the minute. Like, I've, I've, I've got that balance right, you know, and I've found a medication that is right for me. And, you know, man, like I, I've taken um, uh, fluoxetine in the past, which is another um, SSRI that I was told to come off of because it was then told that it increases suicidal thoughts. Which you asked me, but that sounds pretty dangerous. Like just a little bit, yeah, yeah, just a little bit so, dangerous. So, you know, it does take. It's trial and error, yeah, and it is trial and error, and 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 that's at the no, listen, the big farmer and the drug industry and all that type of stuff. They're they're gonna they're gonna be constantly changing anyway. Mm. You know, there's, there's gonna be a drug that the drug that I'm taking now, I'm not gonna be taking in five years. Yeah, because they'll tell me the next one's better. Mm. And if it works for me, then I'll carry on. That's the thing that, yeah, that's a, another part of it that I really struggle with, you know, sort of from my political background and thinking about it in that big pharma sense. But, and that's why I really struggle to say, maybe not struggle, but I do think there has to be a role for medication. It feels almost backwards because when I was younger, you know, you're, you're, when you're like fucking rock yeah, on. Rock on big yeah. pharma, man. Yeah. Um, let's move things on. Let's, yeah. talk, let's talk a little bit about uh, Joe, your friend. Yeah, of course. Tell me, tell me about him. What, what was he like? 
Uh, the best way for me to describe him, um, well, the best way for me to let you understand just how like close we were, is he is uh, well, he was a Spurs fan. It takes a lot for me to like a Spurs fan, um, and uh, yeah, he was a big one. Yeah, and um, no, it, Joe was um, my first day that I went to Capital. I was, you know, I was just Martin, Martin Kemp's kid turning up to do a demo. Mm. They had seen, they had seen, Capital had seen me. I was doing like um, football stuff on YouTube, like out in the street and like asking people on the street and blah, blah, like, you know, yeah. And uh, I'm a lot tamer than what it is now, which is just like your speed, I show speed and all that. Yeah. Like, they're wild. Yeah. But like, you know, it was a lot tamer, but, but they had seen it and um, they asked me to come in and do some stuff for their breakfast show. And the first day I went there, I met this lad who, you know, good looking lad. A uh, bit older than me, wore like almost like a John Motson coat. But I was like, oh, I think I instantly said something about that. Yeah. And then uh, just he, he did not want anything to do with me. Anything like he like and how to get oh, but he just I knew what he thought in my head. Is some rich kid coming in like, oh, why am I doing this? Mm. You know, I'm working on Capital Breakfast. Why am I dealing with this kid? So, and then uh, we, you know, we started working together and then all of a sudden this, this opportunity came up to me to, to do like a Sunday show, like a Sunday morning show. And then they, they asked Joe and they were like, you know, Joe hadn't produced his own show. Mm. And he was like, yeah, I'll do it. And again, he hated me for about six weeks. And, uh, and then, but then it just kept blossoming and, and, you know, it, it turned into this relationship where he and I, we never lived together, but I'd say we were together almost every day of the week. Mm. Um, and we were just so close, man. Like, like you know, you you, you work together, you brainstorm ideas together, and you know, you you'd end up going out together, and sometimes you date the same people. Like, it's it's like it, you know, it was weird, man. But 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 we we were like brothers, mm. you know, and that was it. Saying it about dating as well it makes it reminds you of school, where it'd be like you break up with someone, and then the next week they're going out with your pal, and it's like, oh yeah, it's absolutely. Fine. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it, it was like that, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, he, he and I had this relationship that was. Uh, there's a lot of like maybe there's a lot of uh, people like there's a lot of girlfriends that might be listening to this, and like if you if you have a fella that like he has his guy mate who's always texting, mm. that was Joe. That's me. who you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously, the stereotype is that you know, as men, we don't talk about our emotions that much. Yeah, um, was that the case with you two? <sighs> It's a tough one because the more I look back on it, the more I try to try to think about how many of those conversations we had. I certainly know that I spoke about my emotions because that's just who I am. I've mm. always done that. And I've always said that if I was struggling and I had moments where yeah, I was really struggling. Like, you know, I've spoken about this before. I've had times where I planned out how I was going to do it and all this stuff. And I was very open with Joe about that. Um, you know, and he got me through those times when I was when I was really down, and he was always there for me, always. But with him, he was always so happy, always mm. like, but like fascinatingly happy. Like I remember the last time my 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 other best mate Matt, um, I remember he dropped us off. Uh, we were dropping us off from football. We we had just played football. Joe scored a hat trick, even though he was shit at ball. But like, it, it, yeah, he scored a hat trick. And anyway, we got out of the car. It, it, Joe got out of the car to go home. This is the last time Matt saw him. And he got out of the car, and Matt looked at me and goes, oh, "He's one in a million, isn't he?" And I was like, "What do you mean?" He goes, "He goes, it was just like a person that happy with life and just so easy going." Mm. And so it was that person that. It was that person that made me so angry when he died because I felt like saying, you fraud. I did. Mm. I felt like saying, you fake fucker. You had all this going on. You had something going on. And yet the one you showed me was just the one you wanted to show me. Mm. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And it's like, and I couldn't get that hate out. And I really found it difficult to get rid of that. How did you? Time. And you never really do. Yeah. When I say that to you now, still I still think that. that. Like, I, I, I still am fuming. Yeah. Like, 
listen, when I die and I see him again, I'm fucking hitting him. <laughs> like, it's going to be a scrap. Bit, oh, oh my God. <laughs> like, like, oh boy, is it going to be a scrap. Yeah. Like, you prick. Like, why, man? Like, was that your first emotion? Is that what yeah. you Yeah. Anger. Oh my God. Like, and anyone that's dealt with suicide, you, you know what I'm saying? Because, and, and it, it's difficult because when you feel like that, you're, you're almost like, you know, and I tried to explain this in the first documentary. When you go through like suicidal grief, it's like you're told it's what they wanted. It was their decision. You know, um, it's unfair to say that it's um, selfish of them. Fuck that. Like, I'm sorry, but he can... Go fuck himself. Like, you can say sorry, I'm well. saying so, swearing so much, no, but fine. like, it's he fine. can. And like, like I'll yeah. go and tell him to his face. Mm. Like, all you did, man, is pass all of that shit onto me and your family and everyone else. Mm. So it's like, you know, uh, sorry, I feel like I'm looking at you saying it as no, if, no, no, as no, if no, you're no. him. No, but, no, it, but no. it is that. And do you know what? I even did therapy where, where I, I did a type of therapy and it changed my life a little bit. It really helped me. And my therapist said to me, she, it, was, it was unreal. She, she said, right, I want you to sit Sit where you are, and I want you to look at this empty seat. And I was looking at this empty seat. She says, and Joe's sat there. And I want you to tell him everything. I want you to have a conversation with him. And she goes, and how well do you know him? And I was like, I was like, well, I know him pretty well. And she goes, and then what I want you to do is after, after you've got up and after you've said all you want to say is get up, sit in Joe's seat, and talk to, back to your seat as if you're him. Yeah, all right. But it was amazing because I, I knew what he would say. And you, you, I'm sure that you have mates that you, you know the conversation, yeah. you know how the conversation is going to go. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had it. And it really freed me a little bit. And she said it's a wild bit of therapy that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But, but for me, it was insane. Would you share any of that conversation with us now? Yeah, of course. Well, one of the things, you know, I, I remember, and I said it in the, the documentary, the new one, I just wanted to hear him say I could stop. That I, I can... I, I've done it now. You know what I mean? Like, and... And I wanted to hear him say I'm sorry. And I did from doing that. I, I, and I did. And, and, you know, the other thing was, was I felt like... I, I had this thing where I felt like I really... And it was always in the back of my head. I had to look after his family big time. And, and that was... That was playing in my head a lot. Like, you know, I was starting to thinking, you know, in my head, I was thinking, God, the earnings for the rest of my life, I want a percentage to go to this. And, and you know mm -hmm. what I mean? To keep them sweet and all this type of stuff. And, I, you know, realistically, I don't have to do that. Like, and uh, and I'm not doing that. I, I, I do my work through the charity and we help through that way. And I needed to hear him say that I could let that go, you know? And and I did. And I, and I sat in his seat and I looked at me and I said, mate, I'm so sorry. You know, you, you're doing great stuff and, and you can leave me now. Like, you can, you can let it go. And it was madness. But it was a great bit of therapy. Mm. Yeah. But I bet it was. I don't want to... Um, it's been impossible to speculate, right? And, and sort of the, like, why he didn't talk to you before. Yeah. Right? Uh, but <sighs> I kind of want to probe that a little bit. If, mm. if you know, is it sort of external pressure to, to not... Uh, you know, be the the soft guy that wants to talk about his emotions. Is it is it that he didn't feel confident enough to? I mean, I think the the hardest part for me to understand. Well, no, the hardest part for me to deal with is the fact that I think empathy has a lot to do with it. In the sense of he was so empathetic towards other people that he didn't want to come across as uh, needy, right? Or wanted to deal with this. Kind of, maybe a bit too a stubborn. Burden. Maybe a bit too stubborn. Mm. Maybe a bit too proud. Um. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I think it, it's a million dollar question that that every and what you realize is that every suicide is different to the next. Yeah, every single one. And and you know, and people always say to me, you know, what what should I say? And I, I don't know because situations are different. Yep. But what what I always know is it's always the people that you least expect, and and that's why it was like for him, for Joe. I, I don't know. I think you know that's why. I've, you know, with his dad and with Lou, his sister, we started.
started using, you know, started, well, they, they created Joe's Buddy line, which goes into schools and, and helps provide a mental health expert within the schools and helps, you know, teach the schools what we can do to get better at it, uh, get a little bit better at talking. Because we don't know. Maybe, maybe did Joe feel like he needed someone when he was at school? Did he need someone when he was at work? You know, he was a really hardworking guy. He, he took pressures, I think, a lot. You know, I think mm. he took he took money pressures quite seriously. He took he took um he was never happy with himself, like in the sense of like um you know, he was he was happy in that he would always want to better himself, is what I'm trying to get at. It was always there was always the next step. The next there was there was always a master plan. And I think a lot of the time, if I was to guess now why potentially he's done what he's done, I would probably side bigger towards the thing that a lot of unfortunately a lot of men given the reason is because they're not where they think they should be in their life at that time mm. and that's really sad to me because who's to say where any of us should be you know joe had this idea i think in his head of where he should be at his age he was 33 he had an idea that he should be living in his own house, maybe engaged, have the car, have the job. And he had a few of those things, but he didn't have them all. And, you know, the reality is you live in London and it's hard. You know, he's living with his sister and, you know, all this stuff. Of thing. And that's what's really sad is because life can change like that. And for some reason, he didn't see that. I don't want to, I'm not saying that this is the case with him, but I feel like, some of that pressure it's it's the toxic masculinity side of things right? of course it's it that, is it's that pressure to be the the provider that has breadwinner like you said yeah house car job etc and that i'm sure for a lot of people that is part of the the picture the picture and again it's never one reason right but it's it's part of it but it's part of it but, but, dude like this is the reason why and i want people to know this is this this problem that we have around mental health is is based upon suicide stats that that we see, right? Now these suicide stats uh, around men they heavily outweigh the women. But if you were to look at attempted suicides, the women heavily outweigh the men, mm. right? And this isn't to do with cries for help. I never believe in that saying of cry for help. I, I I genuinely don't. I think I think if you're going to endanger yourself in, in that sense, you are you are on that line, mm. uh, and it is not a good place to be. And in that sense, you know, you look at it and you see the women heavily outweigh it, you know, and, and there's different reasons that I won't go into that, that mean that the completed suicides look so bad for men and not necessarily for women. But what I'm trying to get at here is it, it, it toxic masculinity, yes, plays a role within men, but also for women. There's a lot of women that feel like they're not where they should be. Maybe these are single mums. Maybe these are mums that can't keep up with, you know, the needs of their children and they think they should have been a better mum and they, they attempt suicide. And this is a nationwide problem that doesn't, it's cross gender. And that's why it, this is about everyone, mm. you know? When you went in, in the documentary, you go into parliament, right? And you have a yeah. meeting that involves um, MPs. Yeah. And you seem quite, uh, well, to be blunt, disillusioned uh, yeah. with, with that process. Could you tell me a bit more about that? It was like a comedy sketch. It was a deeply, yeah. It's like simultaneously deeply unfunny, but also quite funny at the same time. But yeah, that it was though. Like because I tell you why, right? It's like again, like, and and this isn't like I don't know. People people are so like quick to if you talk on any form of like MP or anything like that or like political party, they're like, oh, you're siding with this. I was like, no, nah, this is just like I'm just telling you what happened. Like mm. we went into this, we went into a room, a tiny little room. And these kids in there are people who have attempted suicide. And they're as young as like 10 to 15. Like there's, there's some really young kids in there and some older ones. And, you know, they're, they're guardians. And these kids are telling these MPs about their pressures in their lives and why, you know, we need as a government to be able to be in there for as early as possible. And not just look at intervention. It has to be prevention. And I swear to God, it was like, it was like something out of the office. Like it was like... All they cared about was they were like, oh, yes, thank you for the suicide chat. We've put out lovely sandwiches. Like, please, you know, take them. And then it's like, oh, should we get a picture? Oh, hold up the sign. Don't kill yourself. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but that's what it was like. That sounds quite funny, to be fair. And you know, you're just like, what is going on? Yeah. Like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like 
These it's kids sort of are surreal. These kids are like putting their like stories to you. Just listen. Mm. Just listen. Stop thinking about whether or not someone's taking a picture of you. Like, mm. just listen for a second. And and you know, there's so many times where that happens. But that does happen in this world. And and that's sad. And it was. I think it was just sad for me to see the reality mm. of it. Uh, and you know, and there's MPs that come in and. I'm told I'm not allowed to speak to them and it's all getting a bit strange. And so I just have to stand in silence and clap. You know, kids are crying in the corner whilst an MP's smiling. Getting, it was like insane. But, mm. you know, it, it was really sad. It was really sad. And, and it was a moment that, you know, no kid should, should have to go through that. And, and that's why I feel like it was so much an important. That's why I do feel like it's a, it's a fight because... So far, the people in power, whoever that is, it hasn't, they haven't been doing what they should be doing. You get the impression that it's almost, it's a photo opportunity rather than, you know, as demonstrated by the fact that it's not in oh, the King's dude, speech. Oh, let me tell you, 100% it's a photo opportunity. Yeah. Uh, You've seen to be speaking about it. Yeah. Oh my God. Like, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, full stop. Yeah. Have you received any kind of sort of, um, you know, governmental political response to, to this? Like, is, has there been any sort of positives you can point to that's not just, you know? Um, no positives. Right. Um, uh, the I, I obviously received a response um, uh, from the people in power when when I wrote the letter, mm. and that response was yes, thank you. Um, we will go to fifty percent, and I'm just like, oh, fuck. Mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we will go to fifty percent, which is pathetic. Yeah. Uh, no other word for it like again I go back to that thing that I said to you earlier like, do you think an examiner would be good with that mm. like uh, uh, I'm sorry but if you're if you're guaranteeing me that that, that they're going to be in 50% of schools by next year then okay that's a good start and then let's work to the next one but you're not even working towards 100% mm. what's the point in even writing it <laughs> so yeah. you well, know and I go back to this thing bullet. I said before like genuinely like if that's the case then my next question to them, and they're yet to answer me, is if you have two kids in front of you, how do you decide which one gets help? That's what you're saying. That's what they're saying. That's what they want to do. Mm. So let's ask them. Going through what you've been through, learning what you have over the course of this process, how important are your male friendships, the ones that you have now, to you? Yeah, so important. Man. Telling your friends that you love them. It's really important. Fuck yeah. And I, and I mean that. Yeah. And I, and I really mean that. Like male friends. Mm. Like, you know, like I, 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 I say it all the time, like to, to my guy friends, like, you know, like, and my best friends, they know it. Uh, and they are so important. I think it's hard because our, our friendship group got rocked so badly by it that we know the fragility of it. Mm. And, you know, we're, we're, we're very up on each other. And, and I think friendship is one of the most beautiful parts of life, you know, and, and it's the same, you know, love is that, but, you know, friendship is love at the same time. It's, it's respect as well. And, and, and w having that with anyone is, is so fantastic. You know, that's why I feel so sorry for so many people that are out in the UK and they're lonely, you know, they don't really have any friends and stuff like that. And because, you know, in the first documentary, I realized I wasn't making a documentary about suicide. It was about friendship. Really, that's that's what I was making, and and mm. how you can protect one another. Um, so yeah, it's really important. I can't emphasize that loving, so and saying it point enough. My um, one of my boys got married recently, and I was obviously there. Yeah. And in his speech, he said, um, "I want to I want to tell everyone in the room that I love them." Yeah. I le he said, "I le learned this from Ollie. Say I love you to your friends because it's like it's such a powerful thing." And when he said it. It's so moving to hear. Like yeah, you, you know, you know, like you've known each other for years and years and years. You know that's how he feels. Yeah. But it's like you've never actually said it. No, no, no. hundred percent man. Fucking say it, you coward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's important, man. Yeah. You know, it's not just saved for your partner. I love you shouldn't be sent just to your partner. It's not just a romantic thing. No, yeah. no. Of course it's different when you say it to your partner, but you know, there's love can be in different ways. Mm -hmm. And um I guess just finally I'd ask you how you are now. Um you know, you start a conversation with how are you, don't you? With yeah. Finishing it with how are you? Yeah, but it's nice to it's nice to finish it because uh, do you know what? Uh, at the minute, I'm okay. I'm at a stage now where I'm in my head where I'm like, oh, I might need a little bit of a break about talking mental health for a little bit, maybe. 
I, I think I think I don't want to say it, but I think that is my last documentary in mental health. Mm. Um, as of right now, in my head, it is. You know, because it's a lot to to take in. I'm good at the minute. My life gets dictated by Arsenal results. Up and down. Yeah, up and down. More up than down recently. More up than down recently. Yes, 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 yes. But, but, like, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm good, man. How, How are you? you? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you for asking. I'm are well. you really? Yeah, I am okay. There you go. I am good. okay. I am okay. <laughs> Roman Kemp, thank you so much for coming in, man. Thanks, I really bro. appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you, man. I'll give you one of them because this hand's yeah, sweaty as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>